why did you do this knife? It's so weird. And it's like, well, for every one of you that's like, man, that knife is so dumb and I would never use it. There's like at least one other guy that's like, man, that's exactly what I'm looking for. So we're not trying to make every knife be a home run. We're trying to make knives that fit uses. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to episode number 48 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jim the Knife Newbie Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to, as I said, episode number 48, another good one coming your way, the Knife Junkie Podcast. We've got a uh, guest from Tops Knives we're going to be talking to, and I guess, Bob, we can call this the the Tops Show, because essentially we're just going to be talking Tops Knives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of my absolute, absolute favorite knife companies. Definitely my favorite production fixed blade knife company. Right. I can talk ad nauseum. <laughs> well, and, and you have several Tops Knives in front of you to admire and talk about, not only now, but uh, during the interview as well. Yep. Uh, yeah, I did. I did indeed have that, uh, have a whole panoply ready to lift up and show off. But eh, it ended up being more about talking than showing off the knives. Any one of your particular Tops Knives that you have that's a, that's a particular favorite? Well... I love the Prather War Bowie. Everyone loves that. And the, and the big, uh, what is it called? The big pig sticker. It's, uh, the wild <laughs> pig hunter. I love that. But a knife I'd like to celebrate right here that you don't hear much press about is the Felony Stop, which is a great name. But the Felony Stop is a, is a little, uh, it's designed by, I think, Derespina, but it's a, uh, it's a little curved knife that's double edged and has a big, Jimped thumb swale that can be uh, used for trapping different techniques. And it's just a really cool knife. You never hear about it. And I'm surprised. I'm surprised. It should be in everyone's belt. Okay. Well, there you go. An endorsement from the knife junkie. But some, some news too. Tops have got some new but yet old knives coming out. Explain, explain that. Yeah. Okay. So this is one of the things I really like about this company. They took the Devil's Claw, which is a, another one of their very small stash away tactical knives. It's got a hawk bill blade and a small curved handle. And they took that knife and, in a stroke of genius, put a karambit ring at the end of that handle. Because basically, it's a karambit. It's always been a karambit without a ring. So they, they elongated the handle ever so slightly, put a ring on the end, and it's the perfect new fixed blade karambit. Got to get my hands on one. It's called the Devil's Claw. It also has a really handsome black and blue G10 handle. Uh, the other redo has been uh, the Street Scalpel, another great name, Devil's Claw, Street Scalpel. Uh, this is a uh, a remake of a knife they've had for a long time, popular uh, uh, full-handled, short-bladed sort of utility knife. And, you know, it's uh, fashioned out of a thick slab of metal. Well, they took that and they made the, they made the steel a little bit thinner. They cut it out of a billet that's thinner, and then they reshaped the blade, made it a little safer so your fingers don't run up onto the blade to the choil and everything. And it is such a cool looking knife, Jim. And uh, so this is something I like. They're, you know, they they looked at some old designs and they weren't afraid to tinker with them and uh, make them better, even mm. years after their first release. And you know, they're also uh, they're also working diligently but slowly on folders. And you want it the work to be slow because they're right. a fixed blade knife company. It takes a while to figure out those mechanics. So, uh, yeah, they've got a lot of really cool things in the hopper. They never, ever seem to be at a loss for designs. And, uh, and would, cool names. And cool <laughs> names. And, you know, and purposes. Everything from uh, little hideout knives uh, for saving your life in the worst moment to big camping knives to bushcrafting knives for carving mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So right. they really uh, they cover the gamut. Well, we're going to talk to someone from Tom's Knives coming up. But first, you know, just hold, make you wait just a little bit longer. I want to talk about the uh, the subscribe feature. Uh, if you go to the knifejunkie.com slash subscribe, we've uh, made that page to where you can subscribe to both the podcast and the newsletter. So it's easy to remember, the knifejunkie.com slash subscribe. You can subscribe to the uh, podcast, any of your favorite podcast apps, or if you just want to go to the website and get the podcast there, you can. You can also subscribe to the newsletter from that very same page. And Bob, quickly, I want to talk about the newsletter because we sent one out this this previous weekend where you kind of covered some of the website issues and the RSS feed issues, but you had a really good list of 
some of the past shows that have been on the Knife Junkie podcast and just want to draw attention to some of those episodes that folks may or may not have uh, had a chance to catch. So a lot of great guests over the past four, six, eight weeks that uh, yeah. folks may want to go back and listen to. Yeah, we talked to Nick Shabazz, Bob Terzuola, Ian Pekarski of CMF Metalworks. Uh, we spoke with Alan Alishowitz and uh, Greg Lightfoot and Tom Krein. I mean, a host of people. I mean, that uh, we were, we were <laughs> right. that RSS feed was out for about seven weeks. So we have a, a good uh, a good roster of people that you may have missed but some of the best interviews so far. So definitely right. go back and um, check them out. The like the all episodes feature on Stitcher because uh, when it wasn't getting sent out, you would have missed it in your weekly feed, but now it's all there. So if you want right. to go back and check out those back episodes from when our RSS feed was over, check out the all episodes feature on your podcast app. Or just go to the knife junkie.com slash listen, and you'll find all of them there. So a lot of great guests. I want to thank you for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast, being with us each and every week, and remind you that the Knife Junkie Podcast is brought to you in part by QuickBooks Connect. If you're interested in learning new skills, growing your business, or meeting other like-minded professionals, then QuickBooks Connect is for you. As a QuickBooks ambassador, we're able to offer savings of $80. That's over 30% off if you just use the code Join Us Now at checkout. You can find out more information on the conference at theknifejunkie.com slash qbconnect. That's theknifejunkie.com slash qbconnect. For details, be sure to use the Join Us Now code at checkout for your 30 plus percent off discount. Bob, without further ado, what's the, let's let the cat out of the bag. Who do you have the chance to talk to today from Tops Knives? I'm speaking with Craig Powell of Tops Knives. You know, Craig, if you've ever seen a shot show or blade show video, uh, on YouTube, you know, when the YouTubers all head to those shows and they go from table to table talking to knife companies to find out what their new products are, Craig Powell is always the man that you hear from from Tops. And uh, he's another guy that I just felt like I knew before I even met him because I've seen so many of those videos. But uh, he's uh, he's got my dream job. And uh, <laughs> and no, it was it was really great talking to him and, and finding out kind of uh, how Tops works inside. The thing that always makes me uh, admire Tops is how many different models they have available. It's not just models right. they've made, but they're always available and they're a small outfit. How do they do that? So we get into some of that great guy to talk to. I guess I'm going too long now. It's hard not to gush, right? <laughs> but you love Tops Knives, and it was a great interview. So why don't we let our listeners gush along with you as they listen to this interview with Craig Powell from Tops Knives. That's good. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. All right. Well, I'm here with Craig Powell from Tops Knives. Craig, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, Tops Knives has uh, long been at the very top of my uh, favorite production fixed blade knives. And I can remember where it all started. It was a certain mystique built up from the ads that used to run in the uh, knife magazines uh, back in the day, uh, I guess even pre-internet. And to me, they were just uh, the epitome of out of reach, totally cool uh, kind of rock star knives. One thing that you guys amaze me is you you have this huge catalog of knives, and almost all of them seem always available. How how do you manage that? <laughs> uh, you know, if I had if I could answer that, it wouldn't be as magical. Um, <laughs> basically, we we have a pretty decent idea of what's what's going to be sold and when. So, um, and then the other thing is the vast majority of our knives are sold through a distributor. So typically we just order knives. We make knives as they're ordered by the distributor. And then we just try to make sure that we always have some stock available in-house. So direct retail sales for us is, is very, very low. Um, dealer sales is, is also, direct dealer sales is also a pretty small channel for us. The, the vast majority goes through distributors. So that's how they always show in stock on the website is just because we... We make them to order for the distributor and then try to keep a small stock on hand. Okay. Okay. Cause I was thinking, you know, I was thinking about this and the only other company that I can think of that has such a broad uh, range of, uh, you know, uh, a whole bunch of different kind of knives uh, that always seem available is Cold Steel. But I know how they do it. They have a lot of foreign manufacturing and, 
it's a different kind of outfit. So uh, how did Topps Knives get started? So the company was started in 1998. Um, there were there was a group of guys that got together. Um, they all had military service of, of some kind uh, in the past. Most of them actually served in Vietnam. The uh, the main guy that kind of that kind of started it all. Uh, his name's Mike, and he so he got together with these guys. They said, "Hey, let's make some knives that we would have liked to have." when we were, you know, when we were in the, in the, the crap. And so basically they, they made the Steel Eagle 107, the, the Tanto point seven inch blade, quarter inch thick, full tang knife, you know, like this is, this is the knife that can do anything. And, uh, they made, they made a few of them that gave them out to, uh, buddies they had that were still in the service and, and that were going to get a chance to actually use them for the, the crazy stuff. Feedback came back, and the guys were basically like, "Look, just just run them. Like, you don't need to change anything. You don't need to do anything. Just do it." So that's kind of where where the company started. Is is let's let's make knives for the guys that are serving our country and and need them need them to be able to withstand whatever they might come up against. And so that first model was the Steel Eagle seven inch Tanto. So you went from that one model to how many how many uh, tops models are there now? <laughs> uh currently active we have i think it's over i think we're over 250 active uh, models and the funny thing is i want each and every one of those and i haven't seen them all but i want them all because well okay i'll, I'll i just had to get that out of the way uh, <laughs> so you start with the steel eagle so it's very very tactical and a lot of the early models are all about uh, that kind of business and then at some point Tops Knives takes a pivot into kind of the outdoor world, more camping and bushcrafty and survival in addition to that kind of tactical thing. How did that come about? So that that's that's kind of an interesting story. Basically, so the first, I mean, the first several years of the company was all tactical. Uh, you know, the, those first knives were the Steel Eagles. The second, the second series of knives were the Cat knives, and those were made like specifically for law enforcement, for cops. Um, and for the, you know, for probably the first, I would, I, I would guess five or six years, pretty much everything was geared towards first responders. The guy that's running the company now, Leo Espinosa, he's been with Tops since about six months after they, they opened the doors. And he is, uh, basically, he was in high school at the time, needed a job, you know, needed, needed some income. And, uh, one of his brothers was working at tops, doing some of the grinding on the nights. So they hired Leo to sweep the floors and clean the bathrooms. And then if, you know, fast forward 20 years later, he's the president of the company and has been for about five years. Basically he's, he grew up hunting, fishing, camping, um, also, you know, all the outdoors activities you would expect from Southeast Idaho, that's what he did. And so when he started, uh, you know, after he'd been with the company for a few years, he was like, you know what, I'm not, I, I, he, he wanted to do more. And what ended up happening is he had to teach himself on his own time, how to grind and how to make knives and how to do the handles and, and all these different things, because they just didn't have time during work hours to let a guy play around on the machines. You know, there was, there was, there just wasn't time. So he put in the work and, and started figuring stuff out and his influence on hunting and, and fishing and that kind of stuff is what ended up getting us into those kinds of markets. So the, the first survival knives, the first hunting and fishing knives, most, and most of those were either came, came from him or were in some way influenced by him. Well, what was the uh, Brothers of Bushcraft? Who are they? <laughs> so the Brothers of Bushcraft, uh, the, the, the story on that is pretty interesting, too. Mike got together with a group of guys that were that are all experts in their own right. And they all bring something a little different to the table. Most of them, you know, like one dude, for example, lives in desert type environment. So he's an expert in that type of environment. Another guy has more of like a humid environment type specialty he knows how to knows how to get around in swamps and jungles and things like mm -hmm. that another guy in the far north so cold and and winter type 
scenarios. And he kind of he got all these guys together and said, "Hey, why don't we make a knife that that can do it all? You know, for for your bushcraft and outdoors and survival type guys. You know, what would be the perfect knife like for everybody?" And so he uh, he got these guys together. Um, they they started with so one of the guys kind of started with a basic drawing. A couple of other guys jumped in. Hey, let's change this. Let's move that around. Let's add this or that. And so all of these guys had a little bit of input on on the knife, and uh, and then we put it out. And, and I think it was as much the design as it was as it was just being timely and and just kind of how it was how it was marketed when it was first released that it just it just blew up. A huge success. I mean, from my perspective, it 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 kind of stormed the scene. And I remember thinking like, hmm, what is this? This isn't this isn't quite tactical enough for my uh, my tops taste. And then I started to watch videos uh, on it. And yeah, it, it looks like the amazing do everything knife. Is that your first Scandinavian grind that, that tops uh, ever did? Was that on the Bob knife? You know what? I think it was, I, I believe that was the first one where we, where we did a Scandi grind. And I think they they had gone back and forth on what type of grind to put on that knife. You know, they were, they were like, let's do a, let's do a flat grind. Let's do a full flat grind. Let's do this and that. And I, I believe, from what I understand, it was actually Joe Flowers' idea to, to kind of do that Scandi grind. So we made the, I think what happened is they made the first couple and uh, Leo put, put that Scandi grind on it. And he's like, you know what? People are going to, people are going to chip these. People are going to roll the edges. It's just, it's just too thin to do a, 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 what would, what most of your Scandi guys out there would call a true Scandi. Mm. So he was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do that Scandi and then I'm going to add a secondary bevel. So a lot of people are like, well, all you're doing is just a flat grind and then you're putting a, a bevel on it. And that's, that's not what we're doing. We're actually putting a Scandi grind on it. So it has a zero edge. And then we add a secondary bevel. So it's still really thin behind that edge, but not as, just not quite as thin as it would be if it was a true Scandi. So you get those benefits of that Scandi grind, the clean cuts, the, you know, the, the, the wood carving capabilities with just a stronger edge. So did that uh, cause a stir? Was that a scandal, a Scandi scandal uh, when that came you know out? What it, it was, it was. And to this day, every now and then we'll get an email from a guy that's like, that's, that's just up in arms about how it's not a true Scandi. And it's like, guys, just, just, just calm down, you know, like pump the brakes. It's, it's, it is a Scandi grind. Like I get that it's not what you want, but, but that's okay. You know, there's a lot of companies that do true Scandi grinds. If that's what you must have, then buy that knife by all means. Right, right. We're not, we're not here to to stab the knife using world in the back. With yeah, this we're not trying to like change history or anything. You know, and, and <laughs> I mean, there's so many guys like Scandi grinds, true Scandi grinds from from the past. We're never like that. And it's like, well, actually, there's there's actually. A lot of evidence that a lot of those Finnish knives did have secondary bevels. And yeah, they all in say, the past. Well, yeah. Are we yeah. comparing now to the past? I mean, the past before lights, the past before, you know, indoor heating and, and all that. Really? We want to go back to that? <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. Do you want to do you want to go back to obsidian knives? Yeah. It looks cool, but man, I don't know. So you yourself do some designing for tops now, right? Uh, uh, the Yakari is yours, right? It's it's sort of a large outdoor knife. Tell tell us about that. And how did that come about? Yeah. So uh, when I started at Tops about five and a half years ago, my background before Tops was a call center. I worked as an I was I was an operations manager. So I was, you know, I was kind of like middle management in a corporate type company. You know, I spent lots of hours behind a desk stuck inside, and I was I was kind of looking for a change. And then, uh, and then something happened. I ended up getting laid off, um, from that, from the company. I put everybody in my area did. And I just kind of fell into the job at Tops, but it was perfect because I was looking for something where I would feel like I, like what I was doing mattered, I guess, like it was an important thing. And so, you know, I started working at Tops. I'm like, man, we were making tools for people that, that could help save their life depending on the situation they're in. So yeah, anyway, I just, I, I felt like I was finally in a job where you could say that I was doing something important. I felt like I was actually helping people. And, uh, you know, that was, that was really encouraging. I grew up same, same kind of scenario as Leo. I grew up 
you know, fishing and camping. I didn't hunt anywhere near as much as he did, but, uh, you know, I was, I, I grew up in Idaho and, and there's not much to do here, but spend time outside. So I, I just started getting into knives real deep, real fast. Once I started working for tops and uh, I did a couple of different trainings. I went down to, uh, you know, I went down to, to Columbia and did that bushcraft global trip with Joe flowers. Um, if you, if you haven't heard about bushcraft global or, or seen that definitely go check it out it's, it's amazing i just started getting into i just really liked machetes and machete designs and and i've been to you know i've been to i speak spanish i've been to mexico i've been to most of the central american countries i've been to you know i've been down to colombia with joe and every time i go there it's just it's just cool to see guys walking around with a machete on their hip like because they use one, not to be intimidating, not because it's a weapon, not not to be cool, but because they're going to use that during the day, either for their job or just whatever they're doing. And and I don't know, I like that. I like that that idea of carrying around a tool like that that that's just so normal to them. But if you saw it in Idaho, it'd be kind of weird. So on a trip to Costa Rica with my with my wife, we were just we were just being tourists. You know, I saw, I saw, you know, kind of the standard machetes and I saw some guys, saw probably only two or three. I saw a decoration and a couple of guys carrying a knife that looked a lot like what ended up becoming the, the Yacaré. And so, you know, I, talk, I was talking to, uh, to, to Leo and, and Mike about it after the trip and, and they saw it and they were like, yeah, it's, you know, that is, that is different than, than a lot of machetes you'd see out there. And so we were like, all right, let's do it. So... You know, I would say that, that sure, it's got my name on it, but man, Leo, Leo designed that thing as much as I did. So, you know, that, that's what he does. So, How about the rest of the designs? There are so many others, and, you know, I feel like you come out with maybe 10 a year uh, at least. Um, at where least. where do, do the design influences, what's that design process? I know you recently had uh, a, a contest amongst your employees to come up with a knife and one has gone into production cool little knife too uh so what's the process around there for you know inspiration and design and deciding on designs and such so we got 250 models right the reason we have so many models and such a wide variety is because we work with a lot of different people on on knife designs you know i think i think since the company opened we've probably worked with approximately 50 designers when it's all said and done. Um, so a lot of the designs come from outside people, but at this point, and I would say over the last probably eight, nine years, the vast majority of designs come from Leo or are approved or influenced by Leo. So what I mean by that is, is when somebody sends us a design, we've gotten everything from literally a napkin drawing to like full on 3D CAD files, you know, like a, 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 a file that is ready to just put into the machine and run a product. So, um, but the thing is, Leo takes a look at all of those and his, you know, in, in his, with his discerning eye, what he's looking at is, does this knife fit the tops lineup? And, you know, is it going to fill a hole that we have in our lineup? Is it too much like another model that we have? You know, there's, there's a lot of, does it look too much like somebody else's model? You know, there's things like that that we have to take into account. And so he tries to keep an eye on all of that. Uh, so he, so it really everything flows through Leo. By the time a design is finalized, Leo, it's got Leo's stamp of approval. If it does not have Leo's stamp of approval, it does not get shown anywhere. It doesn't, it's just not going to happen. It, you know, it's kind of a, kind of a roundabout way to answer your question, but it's because we work with so many different people. Right. The employee design contest is something we started, uh, this is that we've done, we've done it three times now and we're, we're in the, the fourth one right now where our employees have, they've gotten what it is that we're looking for. And then we'll have something to, to show at shot show, some, some kind of prototype at least to debut. The way we do our, our knives is quite a bit like an assembly line. There's a lot of hand work that goes into every single knife. There's a lot of different layers of quality, but most people only know how to do you know, two or three parts of the job. You know, the guys that are making the sheaths are not the guys that are making the handles. And the guys that are painting the knives are not the guys that are sharpening the knives. So 
what we wanted to do is try to get people involved in more of the process so that they, you know, just, just so that they could appreciate more what it is that they're working on. Because I think a lot of times it's easy to just go to work and do your job and go home and not realize what it is, like how important what you're doing is. So it's been a pretty cool thing that way because the employees get to see, first of all, that, you know, it's not that easy to design a knife, especially now where there's thousands of knife designs. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's not a simple thing to, to design something that hasn't been designed. Um, then they get to kind of see the process of, of that their knife goes through and they get to be more of a part of the company. It just, it's, it builds a lot of, it, it actually builds a lot of morale. And it's, it's been cool so far because we haven't seen anybody get hard feelings because their design didn't make it and somebody else's did. You know, people, pe- people for the most part just come up and give the guy a handshake and a hug and say, hey, good job, man. That's a really cool knife. So it's a cool thing. I, I like your point um, about most people, you know, myself included, you do work, you create a thing, you produce it, you send it out into the world, but then you have no idea of what impact it has or if people even use it or view it or whatever it is. And to create something as useful as a, as a knife and then have it produced by your company, I mean, that would be a great honor for sure. And it would make coming to work a, a heck of a lot uh, more interesting, I got to say. Yeah, agreed. And Leo, Leo says all the time, I wish I could take every employee to the trade shows that we do at least once so they can hear from from the people who actually buy and use our knives what it means to them. Like we get people at every show that just they just want to give Leo a big hug and you know, because they, they, they either just appreciate what he does or their the knife mean has some kind of sentimental value or you know, they're just you you have a whole new appreciation for the company once you've been to a to a show and talked to people and, and and see how how they feel about your company. It's pretty pretty cool. So I want to uh, I want to talk about a knife that came out this year that has been my favorite and one of my most carried knives this year, and that's the Rapid Strike. I love <laughs> this knife. I ordered it uh, double edged, and uh, it's just such a uh, such a great little knife. And for my purposes, uh, though I loved the uh, the glass breaker pommel, I. I ground that off because I like to put my thumb there. So it wasn't as comfortable for me, but it just made it a more perfect knife for me. Uh, tell me about this knife and the genesis of it and uh, who designed it, how it came about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Rapid Strike is, uh, so Leo designed that knife. It came about through just some different conversations we were having with people in the industry about what what people are looking for now. And, and I think it shows kind of the evolution of the, uh, you know, too bad it's not video because you can see me doing the air quotes, tactical knife. Mm-hmm. You know, back in the day, a tactical knife people thought of as a large, heavy knife that could bust open doors and stab people through helmets. And, you know, you that, that like Rambo-esque feel. That was a tactical knife. Nowadays, a lot of tactical knives are the kind of knife that people don't see until it's too late. You know, it's, it's, it's that one that you can hide on your person that you can use to defend yourself with that you can, that that's, that's to be felt, that's not seen. quick. Yeah. It's fast. It's, it's, you don't want to be, you don't want to be swinging around a big, heavy brick of a knife. You want to be, you want to be quick. You want to be in and out, you know, you want to be surgical. And so it's, uh, it's that kind of a feel in the industry now with, with tactical knives, uh, you know, cause it's just let's face it. There's not a lot of people getting in knife fights today, right, right. and you know we we realize that. So the, basically, what Leo wanted to do is he wanted to to get something that was it, it, he wanted something slim that could conceal easily that you could wear horizontal, vertical, inside the waistband, outside the waistband, in your boot, strap it to your pack, put it on your vest. You know whatever you needed, this knife would fit in that location and i feel like we hit that pretty darn close you know he added the uh, I, th- I thought it was really cool how he added the gym thing all the way around the handle yes oh big fan of that yeah 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 it doesn't stick out so it's not digging into your hand but it's enough to give you just that little bit of extra grip yeah um and then i mean he just the thing that always amazes me is is if you 
go to our website and you like you click on knives and then on the left you can filter put put, put leo's name in there uh, as the designer like down scroll down you'll see pick pick you can look at knives by designer put leo's name in there you're gonna see such a crazy variety of knives i don't think there's a lot of people that can design like that most people they have a certain type of style and whether the knife is large or small it looks the same you know there's, there's at least something that looks similar but you'll see you'll see stuff that's all over the map with him it's just it he's he can design anything he really can and the stuff that he doesn't design like the stuff uh like that big giant karambit and oh, yeah. the uh, and the backbite like he didn't design those but he's still accepting of these very kind of out there designs that are very purpose driven and i i respect the hell out of that and another thing that is so cool about Topps knives are all the small knives. There are so many small, great little weird fixed blades. And by weird, I mean, there are some that are very straight ahead, small utility knives. And then there are some like, like the street scalpel. You mentioned being uh, surgical before you got the street scalpel and you got the new devil's claw with the karambit ring. And then, and then you have the, the, California Cobra. I mean, these are odd little, the cockpit commander got that from my brother a few years ago. These are odd little knives that are totally purpose driven. And I love that you guys make those. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's funny because we get people, they'll be like, why did you do this knife? It's so weird. And it's like, well, for every one of you, that's like, man, that knife is so dumb and I would never use it. There's like at least one other guy that's like, man, that's exactly what I'm looking for. So we're not trying to make every knife be a home run we're trying to make knives that fit uses and so like you said you know that, that cockpit commander for some people that's perfect it doesn't require any training you just pull it put your finger in that hole and just punch and it's that's it you don't have to train but a knife like the backbite like you were saying uh that's that's a that's the kind of knife that requires a little bit more training it was designed on based on the like the russians uh, knife or the Russians fighting system Sistema, I think is actually what it's called. And so, yes. you know, once you, once you see some of that fighting system, that knife makes a whole lot of sense. But before you see that fighting system and you're kind of like, what do I do with this? Yeah. So right. It's, it's cool to see that, that we can, we can do things that'll work for, you know, general everyday kind of use. And then things that are very specific, um, you know, those, those knives will never be our top sellers, but that's okay because we're putting them into the hands of guys that are going to appreciate them. Yeah, right. And uh, if you don't, who will? So I'm, I'm sitting here looking uh, at my Topps knives arrayed out on my desk. I have eight, and uh, they're all, you know, pretty badass kind of tactical. I got the Prather War buoy. I've got the uh, Wild Pig Hunter and the Rain's, Ranger's Edge. Uh, but one of my absolute favorites is a more outdoor knife and that's the tex creek the mini and not the mini the the regular size tex creek that yeah. knife uh whenever i do anything outside in the yard that knife is on my hip and it does everything and it it does it well and i've i've rolled it a little bit you know hitting a hitting a fence when i didn't realize i was swinging towards metal and it just comes back like nothing else yeah leo designed that one too Oh man. <laughs> well, hey, it's it's good he's got a, a knife company he can express himself through. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That was uh that was actually one of his uh one of his hunting knives one year. He didn't even design that knife for tops. He made it, he made one for himself. He cuz he does this thing every year where he, where before deer season, he'll try to he'll try to make a knife. He does it just to kind of like just to he doesn't do it and if he's not in the right mindset, he doesn't do it at all. But usually what he'll do is he'll just, he'll kind of just disconnect from work for a couple of days and just make something that he's not making it for anybody. It's just, I'm going to make a knife and I'm going to take a deer hunting and I'm going to, I'm going to take care of the animal with it. And it's for him. But then, you know, after, after he gets his hunt over with and gets back to work, he's like, you know what? Now we're making this knife. So uh, yeah. that's, that's actually what ended up happening with the text week. It's the lab. He goes into the lab, creates it, takes it out into the other lab out in the woods. Yep. <laughs> exactly. So, so uh, tell me about the uh, the move into folders. I know it was kind of an arduous thing. It's still an arduous thing. <laughs> so folders are, uh, you know, I my my respect goes out to guys that, that – that make folders 
uh, that's that's tricky. And I mean, the the first few are tricky. Then once you kind of get them down, it gets it gets like anything else. It gets easier for you. Right. Um, but there's, you know, we're I, I think part of part of our struggle is that our customers have a certain expectation for what they can do with our knives, but that doesn't apply to folding knives. You know, mm-hmm. like if you think about what you would do with that Tex Creek. And then think about what you would do with, like, say, a Kershaw folder. It's not going to be the same thing, you know? And so, but a lot of our customers aren't going to change that mindset just because they bought one of our folders. They're going to expect it to do what our fixed blades did. Even though saying that out loud, it seems like, oh, that's obvious. Most people right. don't think that. And so, so it almost puts a bad taste in their mouth if the folder can't live up to the fixed blade. So that's kind of been our, our struggle is we don't want to just make folders. We want to make strong folders. Right. So, and, and that's just, it's, it's tricky. You know, we're, we're a small company. There's only 30, um, you know, about 35, 36 employees total. So it's not like we have an R and D team. It's not like, it's not like Leo has time to sit down and just design folders until he gets it right. Tinker, you know, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. So I think, I think part of our struggle is that. Yeah, we've been working on it, but it's not like we're working on it eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. We're working on it a few hours here, a few hours there. And so, you know, when it seems like it took forever for something to come out, people are like, man, that took forever. We're like, yeah, it did, but we, we, we worked on it when we could, not every single day. I think we're getting there and we definitely want to do more folders. I mean, folders, folders kind of rule the market. I think I, I, I would assume that for every, one fixed blade that's sold there's probably five or six folders so you know there's obviously some some market share for us that we're kind of interested in but well, what, um, what's the uh, new folder i'm sorry i just interrupted you craig what what no, is the no, new folder did. and tell me tell me about that and what it's uh, its purpose is well i guess it depends on which one you're, you're talking about i'm thinking of the one that i i've just seen and and I can't remember the name, but it comes in Tanto Point, and it's got, it's got the classic. Uh, oh, tops, you know what? Those tops. aren't even new. Oh, those are. <laughs> that's like an old model being brought back. Yeah. So the funny thing about those is those are those are made by Fox Knives out of Italy. That's the, what it is. The CQT uh, there's the CQT Magnums and the CQT Thunderhawks. Those knives we were we were working with Fox years ago. They made a bunch for us. They were very, they're popular. We sold a lot of them. And then I think what happened is just, uh, just, it was just changes in market. They, they, Fox had to raise the price because the changes were going on with the dollar and with the euro. And, you know, it was all that kind of, that just global economy thing that was, it just wasn't working out. So they raised the price to the point we just couldn't, we just, we, we just didn't think that we could sell them for enough money to, to, to offset the cost. So we kind of, we kind of bagged them for a while. And then we reached out to Fox recently, found out they still had a few, they still had quite a few blades in stock. And we we're like, you know what, what, what kind of price could we get on those today? You know, now that things, things are different, it's been a few years. Mm-hmm. They gave us a price. We thought it could work. So we're selling those. And then we, we've actually got a bunch that are, that are kind of out to the distributor. And we've got another batch coming from Fox Knives probably in the next month. Um, so we'll have, we'll have a bunch of those out. So story on those, they were designed by tops, um, made by Fox knives in Italy, precisely because we're set up for, for fixed blades, not so much for folders. So another, f- uh, folder that, uh, I thought was kind of a brilliant idea was, um, I'm sorry, the names are now escaping me, but it's sort of the folding version of the MSK 2.5, which is another one of my favorites. That's the little neck knife. Oh, mine too. Um, yeah. So you those. made a s- sort of folding version of that, um, which seems just right because it's small. You know that a lot of uh, tastes are, are trending towards smaller knives, so it sort of fits that bill. But also, it's a folding version, if I'm not mistaken, of one of your more popular fixed blades. Yep, exactly. The uh, so we just call it the mini Scandi folder. On the blade, it says MSF. Basically, it's kind of in between the size of our mini Scandi knife and our Scandi Trekker. So those the Scandi Trekker is just a larger version of the mini Scandi. That one, same same kind of deal. It's actually made by Mazarin knives out of Italy, but again designed by Leo. So and and 
the thing is we wanted to make it ourselves, but we didn't want to wait. And so we had Mazarin make it for us because we, we weren't, we weren't ready to do the R and D and trying to make it work. So we sent it to them. They helped us, they helped us make sure that all the, you know, that the lock was going to work and everything was going to be good. I have one of, I have one of the prototypes from when we first, uh, when we first got pieces from them and I, and I still carry it very regularly. For me, the mini Scandi, the Scandi Trekker, that Scandi, that mini Scandi folder, they're, they're like the perfect, like all around EDC type knife. I mean, you can do anything with those. I have two mini Scandis that I rotate between, you know, which one I carry. I have one of the Scandi Trekkers and I have that folder and I'm almost, almost guaranteed I have one of those on me all the time. The uh, mini Scandi in the an initial um, coloration with the with the tan micarta and the black blade with the with the edge bevel still, um, left raw is to me the perfect uh, pocket carry uh, fixed blade. I'm not a big pocket carry fixed blade. Usually I, I carry them uh, in the waistband, but this fits perfectly and it's like you said it's it's incredibly capable. Uh, I love this little knife, the MSK. Oh yeah, they're they're amazing. They're great. <laughs> So you also make bigger, you make folders and, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, machetes, as we discussed before. You also, you're also doing axes. Um, so w- what's the overall mission of Tops and, you know, where do you see the product line headed in the future? I think, I think what we do well is whatever we decide to do, it's going to be good. You know, so if we're going to put out a hatchet, it is going to be a good hatchet for whatever size we're looking, whatever, whatever kind of use we're looking for. You know, like the, uh, the grandpa's ax was one of our employee design contest. In fact, that was the first one that we did, uh, was the grandpa's ax. So what we liked about that one is it was like the perfect little hatchet for somebody who's looking for kind of a light duty hatchet, something that's easy to carry a long distance. You can choke up and use it as a knife. But on top of that, it's perfect for kids, which makes the name make more sense. You know, like grandpa's going to loan his, his hatchet to the, the kid on his first camping trip so he can, so he can play with, you know, so he can play with it and make some kindling and do that kind of thing. And it's not too big. It's not too heavy, but it'll still get, it'll still get the job done. And then you got the hammer hawk, which is like easily twice the size. And what we were looking for out of that was, was something that would look great. Um, at the campsite, you know, the, the, the sheath looks great. The, the, the arrow milled in the head looks great, yes. but then the thing's heavy enough to chop some wood, you know? So that's, that's kind of, that's, that's always been our mission is to make whatever it is that we make. It's going to be a quality tool for what it's made for. What I would say over the next several years, what we would like to continue doing is, is working on folders. If I have my say, what we debut at Shot Show this uh, in in in, uh, in January will include a few folders, if not this year, then hopefully by next year. We've got a ton of fixed blades. We've got small, medium, large, and everything in between. Folders make a lot of sense for us, and then we're also trying to get kind of into the the kitchen knife uh, mm. market as well. So um, I would like to see, you know, I would say in five years, I'd like to see two or three full kitchen sets that people can order, you know, kind of high end, maybe something with a little bit lower price point, but all still made in the U S you know, so that that's folders and folders and kitchen knives have been on my mind a lot, but, but we're never going to stop producing quality fixed plates. That's just not going to stop. Well, Craig Powell of tops knives. Thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast. Uh, It's been a pleasure speaking with you and uh, man, I just, I love tops knives. I, I would say, Keep up the good work, but I know you will, and I'll keep buying them. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> hey, you know what, man? I, I I appreciate that too. It's always great talking to keep people who are as interested in knives as we are. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this uh, this uh, Tops Knives collection of mine growing, and uh, that'll that'll be part of my uh, part of my refining process of the collection. So, again, uh, great having you, and I'll speak with you soon. All right, take care. You know you're a knife junkie if you love your knives more than your kids. We're back on the Knife Junkie podcast. Jim Person along with Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Again, if you want to uh, catch any of the latest podcasts, newsletters, any of that kind of information, YouTube videos, you'll find it all at the KnifeJunkie.com website. Bob, great interview with Craig Powell from Tom's Knives. 
So the thing that really, uh, I think I mentioned this right up front, but this interview really nailed this home. I mean, they're, they're an odd company because, as I keep saying, they have a huge product line, but very few designers. They have uh, knives always available across a wide range of designs, but a very small shop, 30 people or so. So to me, like they, they've really homed in on, on a niche where they can be making all their own things and be, uh, boldly saying everything is made in the USA in our shop. And yet it's not that they're making two or three knives. They're, they can really outfit the entire team. Mm-hmm. And so the, it just goes to show they're like, they're a very nimble company. They can, they can move with, uh, move with the market, but they can also move according to their own whims. It's like Craig was saying. Leo Espinosa wanted to make a big chopper, so they made the El Chete, and you know that beautiful design that he made. And they're the kind of company that can just uh, do that in a year's time. Oh, well, this year we want to put out this knife. Boom, there it is. As opposed to going through a giant uh, structure, uh, corporate structure, uh, you know, and and R and D and all that mm-hmm. to come up with a knife, which is also a good way of doing it. But right. if you're a small company, I think Tops is a great model to follow. Nimble is the the first word that comes to my mind. Is like I want to do this. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, so they they have enough resources to, to to be flexible and do that. Another thing I I like about them and about other knife companies that that do the same thing is they are not afraid to produce weapons. Uh, you know, very purpose driven weapony type knives to go to people who need them because there are people that need them. And uh, I just always like when knife companies aren't squeamish about that. It's mm-hmm. oh, it's a tool. I guess it could double as a weapon. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, what is it? giant clawed serrated knuckle duster like it's not a tool it's a weapon people all right remind you again that if you want to uh, connect uh, with the knife junkie you can uh, shoot him an email you can also follow him on his instagram also uh, catch the uh, videos on the knife junkie youtube channel and of course listen to the podcast find more information on the website find any of those channels contact information subscribe to the newsletter etc all at the knife junkie.com That's going to wrap it up for episode number 48 of the Knife Junkie podcast. And for The Knife Junkie, Bob DeMarco, I'm the Knife Newbie Jim Person. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. 